Good morning. Thank you so much, Dr. Tony. That was a great presentation. My brain was a little impaired after I lost my late husband, and I got through with resilience, thanks to a lot of people in this audience. Um, I'm, I'm vice president of the Aspen Brain Institute, and when I'm not here in paradise, I'm back in Durham at Duke. I get to uh, introduce the next speaker who's talking about healthy brain. I've not met you yet, Max, wherever you are. <laughs> okay, hi. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about him. As one article says, he's young, tall, buff, and handsome. <laughs> he's, he's also a filmmaker, health, and science journalist who's been described as one of the new generation of bright lights. He's authored a best-selling book, Genius Foods, which will be available later, and you'll hear from him about his mom, a fast-walking New Yorker who started to exhibit symptoms that worried him, including brain fog and gait changes before being diagnosed with both Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. They consulted top neurologists who couldn't do much for her. In fact, he called some of those doctors diagnose and adios. Today he's going to tell us what he's learned in searching for help for potential treatments for his mom and pre preventive treatments for himself and hopefully for all of us. Thank you, Max. Oh man, so good to be here. Thank you guys so much for having me. Um, definitely still blushing, I think, a bit from that, from that introduction. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, my name is Max Lugavere. I wrote a book called Genius Foods, which you can see here. Uh, I've got my second book coming out next year, which I'm super excited for. Um, my background is as a journalist. I used to work for a TV network that was co-founded by uh, former VP Al Gore. Um, and that I got to do, it was my first job out of college, and I really got to sort of cut my teeth. But whereas most journalists sort of get into politics, I have no interest in politics. I never have. I'm really interested in health science, nutrition, uh, and when my mom got sick about eight years ago, um, I became fixated on trying to learn everything that I possibly could about how best to protect the aging brain. Um, I focused on it as an independent journalist. I started digging into the primary research, and ultimately I realized that I had something that few people in my shoes with a parent with dementia had. I had media credentials. And so that led to me reaching out to researchers around the world um, to really get up close and personal with um, the research being done uh, to elucidate the kinds of diets and lifestyles that we might adhere to to minimize our risk for conditions like Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementia. I've since um, gone on to become a very regularly reoccurring guest on the Dr. Oz Show, the Rachel Ray Show, the Doctors. I'm working on a documentary on dementia prevention uh, called Breadhead. And I also have a very popular podcast called The Genius Life. So my goal really is to make these kinds of principles actionable and approachable for people of all ages, uh, especially younger people, all around the globe. That's my mission. That's my life's work. And so uh, I'm glad to be here to kind of give you guys a bit of a Cliff's Notes foray into my findings. As was mentioned, my mom at a very young age started to develop the earliest symptoms of dementia. Uh, I had no prior family history of any kind of neurodegenerative disease, so it caught me and my family completely off guard. It was traumatic, as you guys can imagine. And with no prior family history of dementia, I was at a loss. I couldn't explain it. So as somebody who's perennially curious um, and optimistic and resilient in the face of, of trauma, I began to roll up my sleeves and uh, do the research for myself because I was met with uh, abject disappointment in every clinician's office that I had the privilege to be in with my mom. So because I had no prior family history of any kind of dementia, I began to ask myself what it was about my mother's environment that may have pulled the trigger on a genetic weakness in her that led to her being the first person in my lineage to develop dementia. I started to look at parts of the world 
where they have Alzheimer's risk genes, just like we do here. About one in four of us sitting in this room have a gene that puts us at higher risk uh, for developing Alzheimer's disease and other neurodegenerative conditions. But interestingly, in other parts of the world, like in Ibadan, Nigeria, that same genetic risk factor is associated with little to no increased risk for developing Alzheimer's disease. So just to put that another way, to rephrase that so you guys truly understand it, if you are genetically at risk for developing Alzheimer's disease in the United States, you might simply move to Ibadan, Nigeria and see that risk abolished. That's kind of amazing, right? So I started to think about what our ancestral diet might have been like. You know, the kind of diet that human beings might have consumed during the time in which our magnificent brains evolved, right? I mean, certainly our environment has become a lot different, but we ate for millennia, and our diets and our lifestyles led to the evolution of the flagship product of Darwinian evolution, as I like to call it, the human brain, which each one of us is heir to, this magnificent supercomputer. But about 10,000 years ago, we reached a turning point in our evolution where after millennia of growing, our brains actually began to shrink, ultimately losing the volumetric equivalent of a tennis ball. So just to put that another way so you really get to uh, understand it viscerally, we ate for a certain way for hundreds of thousands of years that led to the growth and development of the modern human brain. And then we turned our backs on that diet and our brains began to shrink. We became settlers. We went from being hunter-gatherers to being domesticated by the handful of crops and animals that we could cultivate. And that paved the way for the fact that today, our diets are compo composed primarily of calories from just three plants. Can anybody guess what those plants are? We've got two of them. One more, last one I haven't heard. Not soy, rice. Yes, so today 60% of the calories that we consume come from just three plants, wheat, corn, and rice. And not only that, but these plants are usually pulverized and processed and ground into a dust to form the ultra-processed foods that we now eat with abandon. It doesn't help that our dietary guidelines advise us to consume these kinds of foods at every single meal. We're told to load up on healthy whole grains. Well, recently, Cochrane, which uh, is known for their unbiased systematic reviews in partnership with the World Health Organization, found that there was actually never any good evidence that grain consumption benefits heart health beyond just epidemiological studies that show that populations that eat you know, higher amounts of whole grains tend to have better health. But there we can look to something called the healthy user bias. People who eat highfalutin grains like quinoa and brown rice, they tend to do other healthy things in their diets and lifestyles as well. But when we look at randomized controlled trials, which, is, which are the kinds of trials that can prove cause and effect, which this meta-analysis uh, actually chose to look at, they found that there's insufficient evidence from randomized controlled trials to date to recommend the consumption of whole grain diets to reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease. And of all the researchers that I've spoken to about what causes Alzheimer's disease, it seems that vascular dysfunction, dysfunction of you know, the network of blood vessels that feed your brain nutrients and oxygen may be one of the earliest uh, things to go awry in the body. Now, as I mentioned, these grains are packaged and sold to us in our supermarket aisles. Many of these packaged products make health claims, right? They compel you to want to buy them because they've got that beautiful red heart usually on the box, right? These foods now make up 60% of the calories uh, that we consume worldwide, ultra-processed foods. These foods are dangerous for a number of reasons. I'm going to tell you guys why. Before we get to that, this is one family's uh, food consumption for a week. Yeah, this is uh, highly problematic. See, what these foods do is they drive a process in the body called inflammation. Has anybody heard of inflammation? Yeah, so inflammation is like having a forest fire in the body. It's actually meant to occur, um, you know like those uh, tide spot cleaning wipes when you get a stain on a piece of clothing? Inflammation is naturally meant to spot clean cuts, wounds, bruises, and things like that. 
But the problem is that our immune systems are responding to the fact that our diets, that there's this predominance of ultra-processed foods in our diets. And so now we have widespread chronic inflammation in our bodies. It's like a forest fire. It's the equivalent of a forest fire in our bodies. And our brains sit directly downwind of that fire. Now, our bodies are incredible, right? Like, we didn't make it here through millennia to be taken down by this process necessarily. We have an ability to repair from the damage wrought by inflammation. But the problem is our bodies need the appropriate ingredients to be able to do that efficiently. Now, going back to these ultra-processed foods, if you look on the, on the backs of most of the packages of them, you'll find that they're all fortified with synthetic vitamins. And that's because these foods are nutrient deficient. And it's the reason why, the fact that our diets are based on these foods, 90% of Americans are now deficient in at least one essential nutrient. So even though our bodies have the ability to defend against chronic inflammation, um, or at least acute inflammation, we're seriously handicapping our bodies in profound ways. And so it's causing this damage to our bodies and ultimately to our brains. These foods also drive the chronic elevation of a, of a hormone in our bodies called insulin. Now, insulin is not bad, but when it's chronically elevated, it drives the storage of fat. And many people today are overweight or obese. In fact, two-thirds of US um, adults are either overweight or obese. For the first time in human history, there are more overweight adults than there are underweight. Now the problem when we consume these kinds of foods, again, the packaged processed foods made of ground up rice, wheat, and corn, and these kinds of foods, is that they cause our fat cells to become sort of like a subway turnstile at rush hour in midtown Manhattan. Calories can flow in, but they can't come out. And this is problematic because our brains love to use fat for fuel, but we're basically blocking our brain's abilities to use fat for fuel because we're always eating these high carbohydrate, ultra packaged processed foods. Now when a baby is developing, a baby's brain loves to, loves to use fat for fuel. In fact, mother's milk is full of a type of fat called uh, medium chain triglycerides, which turn into ketones in the body. Has anybody heard of ketones? They're kind of trendy right now because a lot of people are on these ketogenic diets. Halle Berry, I've discovered, is on a ketogenic diet. The Kardashians are on ketogenic diets. Very few people know, actually know what ketogenic diets are, but they basically supply fat to the brain. The brain loves to use fat as a fuel source. But the inhibition of fat metabolism by high-carbohydrate diets may actually be one of the most detrimental aspects of modern diets. And part of this has to do with the fact that fat the brain's ability to use fat is shunted by chronically elevated insulin. Chronically elevated insulin is problematic for many reasons. It's pro-inflammatory. And published in the, the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease, it was suggested that 40% of Alzheimer's cases alone may be attributable to chronically elevated insulin. So for the next few slides, for the, remaining, uh, the remainder of my talk, I'm going to give you guys an antidote to the standard American brain shrinking diet by telling you the foods that you should actually be eating every single day. I call these foods the genius foods. Now, genius foods is not a scientific term. It's sort of like superfoods. But I thought that if I could get people to think about the foods that are most beneficial to the brain, well, then you're going to be able to choose these foods at every meal and maybe kind of elbow out the foods that are less supportive of optimal brain function and brain health. So for one, we've got dark leafy greens, like kale. You should actually write these down. I see some people taking notes. I'm gonna go over the 10 genius foods plus one bonus food. So you're gonna get 11 foods. You should write these down because they're all very beneficial uh, in different ways. So we've got dark leafy greens. Research out of Rush University has found that people who consume a large bowl of dark leafy greens every single day have brains that tend to perform up to 11 years younger, okay? So what you want to do every day, a rule that I lay out in my book and in my work, is that you should try to have a big salad every day. Easy, right? Try to fill it with dark leafy greens like kale, spinach, and arugula. Kale is actually very high in two uh, compounds called lutein and zeaxanthin. These are carotenoid compounds, basically plant pigments, that have been shown in a University of Georgia study to boost the processing speed of your brain. I'm going to come back to those two carotenoids because they're found in some of the other foods that I'm going to mention as well. 
like eggs. When an embryo is developing, the first structure to assemble is the nervous system, which includes the brain. So an egg yolk literally has everything designed by nature to support an optimally developing brain. It's amazing. It's no wonder that egg yolks are considered nature's multivitamin by some. You want to eat the yolks, folks. The yolks are very healthy. They're very good for you. Um, Grass-fed beef. Now, this is very, uh, I think, controversial because red meat, you know, we're always told to limit our meat consumption. And I'm not a, a proponent of eating lots and lots of meat, but I definitely think that it should be incorporated into your diet. And this is in contrast to grain-fed factory farm meat. I am not endorsing that in any way, shape, or form. No way. But grass-fed organic beef is rich in a number of compounds that support brain energy metabolism. The fat of grass-fed beef is also very rich in those two carotenoids, lutein and zeaxanthin, which are not only good for your brain health, but your eye health and your skin health as well. Grass-fed beef has three times the vitamin E of grain-fed beef. Vitamin E, there's a strong relationship between the consumption of foods that contain vitamin E and better brain health. Why? Because vitamin E is a fat-soluble antioxidant. Again, it's a fat-soluble antioxidant. Why is this important to the brain? Because the brain is made of fat. And it's not just made of any type of fat. It's made of a fat that's very prone to oxidation, which is a process in the body that's sort of like accelerated aging. We want to consume more antioxidants, especially the fat-soluble ones. Wild salmon. Wild salmon is full of the building blocks that your brain requires to grow healthy new brain cells. Avocados. Avocados have a higher concentration of fat-protecting antioxidants than any other fruit or vegetable. They also have twice the potassium of a banana, which supports cardiovascular health, which is very important for brain health. And um, also a very good source of fiber, which is going to fill you up. Extra virgin olive oil. Extra virgin olive oil is actually a fruit juice that human beings have been creating, pressing from olives for thousands of years. Unlike these newer industrial oils like canola oil, corn oil, and soybean oil, which I'm going to use the word toxic to describe, extra virgin olive oil is actually quite healthy, and it's a staple of the Mediterranean dietary pattern, adherence to which is associated with a robust risk reduction for developing dementia and Alzheimer's disease. Mushrooms. Mushrooms are incredible. There's some really cool epidemiological uh, research coming out of Asia where they're finding that people who consume mushrooms habitually have dramatically reduced risk of developing both dementia and a condition called mild cognitive impairment, which is sometimes referred to as pre-dementia. If you eat about a half a plate of mushrooms a week, They've found that over six years, there's a 50% risk reduction for developing mild cognitive impairment, which correlation isn't causation, but empowering to know nonetheless. Cruciferous vegetables, like broccoli, kale, cabbage. These uh, vegetables give your body the raw materials for your detox pathways. A lot of people are spending money these days on detox teas and the like. Cruciferous vegetables are the ultimate detoxification uh, stimulus, stimuli for the body. I'm going to try to rush through the next few slides because I've only got a few minutes left. We've got berries. I'm a huge fan of berries, blueberries in particular. The color in blueberries uh, have been shown to accumulate in the hippocampus, which is the memory center of the brain, um, and protect it against oxidative stress and aging. People who consume more berries tend to have better memory function. Animal studies validate this fact. Dark chocolate. I usually get cheers from the audience. Uh, cocoa flavanols, very beneficial, supportive of, of heart health. Again, habitual cocoa consumers tend to have better brain function. And there's even a correlational study that's found that countries where there's higher per capita chocolate consumption, they have higher, low, higher um, numbers of Nobel laureates. So <laughs> it's a fact. Almonds. Again, a very uh, important source of vitamin E and magnesium, which is important for DNA repair enzymes in the body. Um, nuts in general are important. You just want to make sure that they're either raw or dry roasted. Raw or dry roasted. Generally, if they're roasted but not dry roasted, that means that they're fried, usually in very unhealthy oils. 
Now, where's the hard data that all of these kinds of changes are going to actually minimize your risk for developing cognitive impairment? Well, I had the pleasure of going to Stockholm, Sweden, where I interviewed the lead researcher behind the finger study, which is some of the best evidence to date that our choices matter when it comes to our brain health. By adhering to a battery of these kinds of, uh, you know, the di a dietary pattern similar to the one that I've described, they found that in an older um, population of adults that were at risk for developing cognitive decline, that eating a healthy diet compared to the control group that was just given standard of care, they had an improvement in their brain's processing speed by 150% and an improvement in executive function by 83%. Or you guys live in uh, Aspen, there's lots of great hikes. I live in Los Angeles, you know, we have the same. But I'm also a big fan of resistance training. And I like to talk about resistance, resistance training in particular because it's underappreciated in my view. Having stronger muscles is correlated to better brain health. We can see this in a number of studies that have come out recently. And not just uh, brain health, but mental health. Published over the past um, year, we've had a number of really important and well done meta analyses that have found that not only is aerobic exercise critically important for um, treating depression, um, but resistance training, which I've highlighted on the, on the, in the bottom two, are critically important for a treatment for, as a, treat, as a potential treatment for depression and anxiety. So, Really, really critical stuff. Get to the gym. It's medicine for your brain. Um, and in fact, uh, exercise is now a new treatment guideline, according to the American Academy of Neurology, that a physician can write on a prescription pad um, to, to prescribe to patients with mild cognitive impairment. There's no other uh, FDA-approved drug, as I sit here talking to you guys, for the treatment of mild cognitive impairment. So exercise, again, truly is medicine. Now. When I began my research, one of the most startling things that I've found and I experienced in myself is that, you know, brain health is something that it's a huge knowledge gap for people. And I've sort of made it my mission to fill that gap. AARP performed a study where they found that, you know, many people will concede brain health is critically important, but very few people actually know how to boost it. So I'm uh, super excited that, you know, the Brain Institute is here pivoting towards brain health. I think it's critically important. It's the most important uh, conversation, I think, of our time. And a new dementia case is diagnosed every three seconds, which is startling. So that's it for me. I hope this was empowering to you guys and actionable. Thank you guys so much for listening. And thank you, Glenda, for having me.